with you all this morning. All right, um, I have been part of FIRST Robotics since 2011. Uh, my husband and I coached Team Storm and we enjoyed eight years of exciting FLL seasons and competitions. Uh, we got to meet great people. We watched amazing robots. We learned about truly innovative solutions. Um, but I think the best part for me was that I got to witness up close the extraordinary impact that FIRST Programs has on students. Uh, we retired our team in 2019, and many of my students, you know, went on to uh, participate in a FIRST Robotics Competition high school team, or they volunteered at events or mentored teams um, and stayed involved that way. I, too, get to stay involved as a FIRST Senior Mentor for Indiana, where I get to help expand access uh, to FIRST programs for students across the state, uh, and I get to connect with uh, coaches like yourselves. Uh, let's see, I was uh, drawn to this program because of first mission to be, you know, to inspire science and technology leaders. Um, but I also love that it offers so much for students who may not go into STEM fields, uh, like my daughter who participated in FIRST for nine years and is now double majoring in political science and communication because she wants a career in STEM education advocacy uh, so that uh, more students can experience you know, the same opportunities that she had uh, when she participated in FIRST Robotics. So no matter the career path uh, that your students take, this program develops STEM savvy students uh, who possess workforce skills like you know, uh, critical thinking, complex problem solving, uh, time management, communication, collaboration. I mean, these are the skills that are going to drive their future success. Um, so as you recruit your students, just be mindful of the fact that uh, you don't need to look for that stereotypical engineering or science student um, because every student can benefit from their experience on a first team. Uh, I'm happy that you've accepted the, you know, challenge to coach a first Lego league challenge team for the Cargo Connect season. You know, perhaps you're brand new uh, to FLL, or maybe you have a couple years experience, or maybe you're coming back after taking a break. Uh, no matter your status, we are happy to have you on board, and uh, we're here with you for the journey. So we hope that we can help you in whatever way we can. Um, I'm going to spend my time uh, chatting about the areas you see here that I think are most important um, as you jump into the Cargo Connect season. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions at the end, or as Chris said, you can throw them in the uh, chat box at any time. Um, um, but you know, at the end, we'll, we'll try to save time so you can unmute yourself and ask those questions. Uh, so I hope I can get you off to a strong start and at the very least get you uh, excited for what lies ahead. Uh, so let's get started with forming a team. Uh, you'll want to recruit uh, up to 10 team members, ages nine to 14. Uh, team members must not exceed the age of 14 on January 1st of the year the challenge is released. So basically what that means is you could have a 15 year old on your team as long as on January 1st of this year, they were 14. Um, you may have already given thought to how you're going to structure your team. Many coaches will do like a grade level team. So you might have all fourth graders on your team or all fifth graders. Some do mixed grade level teams, which I think is really nice because um, as your students gain experience, when the new uh, students come in, you can see them you know, teaching the younger students. And I think that's really great for developing leadership skills. Um, some teams might be community or neighborhood teams. You could have scouting or homeschool teams or even you know, all girl teams, which are great opportunities. Uh, for the kids. Um, some things you might want to consider, uh, you don't want to have too small a team that you don't benefit from a variety of ideas and knowledge. You don't want to go too large where you might struggle keeping everyone involved in a hands-on experience. Um, you might want to think about uh, the, you know, whether you'll uh, ask for, you know, a fee to, to participate, you know, to help with registration expenses or maybe to, you know, purchase more equipment. Uh, you might want to uh, consider having attendance requirements or behavior expectations. 
Uh, you might want to have some support from the caregivers, you know, whether you're asking them to provide snacks, maybe drivers for field trips or competitions, or even just helping you um, supply the craft materials that you'll need. Um, uh, when you are uh, selecting your students, one thing that you, you know, want to keep in mind is that you can only have 10 on your roster for competition day. Um, so you, you, you want to think about that because you don't want to invite more students to participate, say you have 12 or 13 and then come competition day you have to, you know, uh, select the students who are going to go to an event. Um, so, you know, some some coaches, you know, struggle to get 10. And then if that's the case, you just do an open invitation to whomever wants uh, to join. Um, but if you do find that you have a lot of interest, you might want to consider having teacher recommendations, maybe do some sort of application process where the kids have to, you know, uh, explain why they're interested or have a passion for this, uh, this uh, uh, FLL team. Um, and, uh, and you might want to lay out those, you know, behavior and, ex and attendance expectations because that may help you, you know, come up with just the right amount of kids um, who are able to meet those requirements. If you do have a really large team, you know, and you, you don't want to turn kids away, then we can certainly help you um, start a second team um, uh, in your area, which would obviously be the best scenario. Uh, Let's move on to team meetings. Once you have a team, you'll need to consider how often to schedule your weekly meetings. Um, that's going to depend a lot on your schedule, of course, um, when the meeting room is available um, and when your students are able or willing to meet. Uh, most uh, team meetings tend to be an hour and a half to two hours. Um, meeting twice a week is ideal. Um, more frequent meetings may be, uh, be necessary as you get closer to your event because there's a lot of loose ends to tie up uh, before your event. Um, as far as the meeting structure goes, just make sure you have a balance between the project and the robot game um, with fun team building activities where you can teach the core values um, and improve teamwork and communication skills because those are such uh, an important part of this program. Um, I do like to assign homework uh, on my teams. Um, and, uh, at, you know, this isn't always met enthusiastically, but um, at the very least, I would ask your students to regularly check for updates. You can either assign a couple of students to do that or have them all do it and report back at your meetings. Um, updates are listed on the, the first um, website and uh, we'll drop that link in the chat box. Um, but first doesn't regularly update, um, you know, on say a weekly basis. It's, it's based on uh, questions that they've received from the community. And if there's anything where they need to provide a clarification, they will do that through the updates page. Um, and uh, it's good to keep on top of that because, you know, those updates can be really helpful. You know, you may have interpreted something one way and then they clarify that so that, you know, it'll give you a better understanding of, of the tasks that you're, you're meant to accomplish during the season. Um, other homework suggestions might be just to ask them to download and read all the, the robot game rule. Uh, rules in the robot game rule book. Um, you might ask your students to divide research topics among team members so that they can do a little of the legwork at home and, and then come to meetings, you know, um, where you can get um, more work done together. Um, they, you might ask them to locate experts that your, your team can reach out to, you know, maybe assign each student two experts to find um, that you can communicate with either in person or virtually. Um, they might brainstorm problems related to the innovation challenge and come back with, you know, printed out research that they've collected. Um, or once you have a project idea, you can ask students, um, and I think this is really important, to regularly look for solutions to the problem that you're solving. You may come up with a solution to a problem this season that already exists. Um, that's not the worst thing that can happen because then your students can maybe um, change that solution in some way to improve upon it. Um, but it is important that they know what solutions um, are currently out there to the same problem that they're trying to tackle. Um, when you're structuring your meetings, uh, there is a team meeting guide that first uh, uh, provides and there's something called the session layout. Um, 
First basically breaks the season into 12 two hour meetings. Um, and it provides really great information to kind of, you know, break up all the tasks meeting by meeting. Um, this is easy to modify. So if you're, you know, uh, don't want to do a two hour meeting, maybe you're meeting for an hour, an hour and a half, a couple of times a week instead of once a week, then, you know, use this as, as a guide or an outline um, as, you're, as you're working on your schedule. Um, and the nice thing about this session layout um, is that the students also have an, an engineering notebook to work from. And as you can see from the arrows that I drew in here, um, they correspond nicely so that you can see your tasks as a coach and uh, they can see their tasks as, uh, as, as teammates. And, uh, and this is really great you know, for when you're setting your, your team goals. And we'll talk about that next. Um, use the resources that uh, FIRST provides for setting the, the goals, um, but also use the rubrics. Um, and we'll drop that link in the chat box, um, how you can directly get to your rubrics. Um, they're great because, you know, the rubrics will show the specific tasks that, you know, judges will evaluate your team on, um, on the day of the competition. So having a good understanding of, of what you're meant to accomplish throughout the season will help you when setting your goals. And set weekly, monthly, and seasonal goals, um, and be sure to balance between the uh, robot game, the project, and core values when setting those goals. And I really think it's great to get your students involved in the process when creating goals. I think it helps students be more committed to staying on task when you know, they've had a hand in, in creating those goals, you know, they're their goals and not your goals. Um, so um, help them choose realistic goals based on um, your current experiences. Um, and maybe that's related to whatever COVID restrictions you have. Um, maybe it's related to, you know, the general knowledge that your students have about FLL or about robotics in general. Um, all of that's going to shape the way uh, you plan out your season. Um, and if you do set deadlines for yourself, uh, just revisit those um, and be sure to uh, practice flexibility and patience um, and remind the kids to do that. Um, so, uh, Early in your season, your students will enjoy choosing a team name. Um, teams are assigned a number by first uh, that will stay with you throughout your entire career as a uh, first Lego League team, but your name can change from year to year. Um, and your, your uh, team identity, you know, your name can be linked to your school's mascot, your community, the current uh, season's theme, or maybe your specific innovation project that your kids, you know, came up with, or really anything else that gets your, your students excited about working together. And uh, then once they have a name, uh, it's kind of fun to give them time to, you know, brainstorm ways to develop that, you know, team identity a bit, you know, they might want to create a logo or, you know, choose a, a team mascot. They might want to design a t-shirt that they can wear on competition day. T-shirts are optional, but you'll find that, you know, most teams have them. Um, and, uh, you know, or, or just plan out anything that will give them a, a fun and, uh, you know, engaging personality when they go to their events. You know, you'll see that, you know, by this picture here is just showing how, you know, kids will use props to, you know, to, help their presentations be fun and engaging for the judges. Hats are, uh, are a popular item and among the first community and you'll see judges and refs wear you know, fun hats too. So the kids often like to do that um, when they're, they're planning out what they're going to do uh, for their uh, presentations. Um, so uh, within the first few weeks or as soon as you start to get to know your students' strengths and uh, personalities, it's great to choose leadership roles. Uh, this is not something every team does, but I think it's really important um, way to, you know, build leadership and communication skills, which are such a big part of, you know, the first robotics experience. Um, we'll talk about team building activities in a few minutes because I think those are great ways for you to discover your uh, team members' um, strengths and find those, you know, standout leaders that are surely going to surface. Um, 
But I think whenever possible, it's really wonderful to give everyone some sort of leadership role. And I have several listed here. There's you know, many more that you can, you can select. Um, be sure to explain to students that, you know, and I remind my students of this often, um, that leaders are not the ones who, you know, do all the work in whatever area they have been assigned, um, but instead it's their responsibility to make sure their work, the work gets done. And even more importantly, it's their responsibility to make sure that all of their teammates are involved in that process. Um, and kids really need to learn how to step into those leadership roles, um, how to treat each other, how to speak to each other, um, how to make sure that everyone's being heard, um, and, uh, and also that everyone is in, engaged in all three areas of FLL. Um, it's, it's okay for some kids to be more drawn to say the robot game or more drawn to uh, the innovation project. Um, but I think that um, when you allow all of them to participate at least you know, to some degree in all three areas, then it's going to make for a stronger, more well-rounded team. And I think you can really lean on your leaders to help you make that happen um, by, by making it their job to make sure their teammates are engaged in whatever task you're uh, trying to complete. Um, and if you'll see in this blue box that I've highlighted, um, I highly recommend investing time helping your students understand and really embrace the uh, first core values because as they do, they're going to grow into those leadership roles and they'll become you know, strong and trusted and uh, empathetic leaders. Um, and, uh, and this leads me to uh, the core values. Um, to me, what makes this program so unique is its emphasis on uh, a set of core values that really drives all the actions uh, on and off the playing field um, and guides those actions. Um, I think most judges would tell you that the very best teams are the ones who take these values to heart. Um, the six core values listed here, um, are best understood and practiced when you discuss them in tandem with the first philosophies of gracious professionalism and cooperation, uh, which are at the heart of everything we do across all FIRST programs. Uh, those two terms were coined by the late Dr. Woody Flowers. Um, he joined forces with Dean Kamen 30 years ago when, when Dean founded FIRST. Um, he was trying to you know, develop a program that would be unlike anything else, you know, and one that would not encourage winning at all costs, um, but would instead be based on mutual respect. Um, the, uh, let's see, the first community lost this legendary figure uh, almost two years ago now. And, uh, you know, it, it's reassuring to know that that his legacy is going to live on through coaches like yourselves who are, you know, trying to build and empower, you know, globally minded citizens. Um, and I just would like to introduce you to Woody here by playing this uh, brief video. Hi, I'm Woody Flowers, and I've been part of FIRST for a long time. I really love how FIRST helps us learn that working hard can be fun and profoundly satisfying. In FIRST, we do our best work while helping others and treating folks with respect and kindness. This ethos is something I like to call gracious professionalism. As you go through this FIRST season, Please remember that it is extremely important. In fact, it's expected that you practice gracious professionalism. Everyone, first students, coaches, parents, volunteers too. It's not always easy, but it will make first a sweet experience and it can have a big positive impact in all areas of your life. So go be kind and creative. So I'll add that on competition day, uh, 
refs are going to look for gracious professionalism demonstrated at the robot game table. And of course, judges will um, see how your uh, students demonstrate the you know, six core values, teamwork, discovery, inclusion, innovation, impact, and fun um, as they present their innovation project and their robot design work. Um, the other cornerstone of this program is cooperation. And as you can see, uh, this is a term that uh, combines cooperation and competition. Uh, to be clear, we don't downplay competition at all at first events. Um, in fact, competition can be fierce, uh, but it should be well understood that it also includes a desire to uh, you know, empower others whenever possible. And this includes your opponents. Um, it's about having a vision that's bigger than, you know, your, you know, bigger than an individual's or even your team's self-interest. Um, and I find that this is super relevant for middle school students who, you know, often try to outperform even their teammates, you know, whenever they can. Um, I think we've probably all seen that happen. Um, so teaching cooperation to your students allows them to see that, you know, the team is better when all the members of the team are better. Um, and that they'll start to understand that even at competitions, you know, a competition is so much more exciting when all the members of the team are performing at their best. And really when your opponent is also performing at their best. Um, you'll find that, you know, it's not unusual at first events to see other teams helping each other out on the playing field when things go wrong. Um, and when you have the opportunity to witness that sort of thing, you know, that's really exciting. Um, so a great way to discuss these core values with your students is through fun uh, team building activities. Uh, we try to do this at least once a week with our students. And of course, you know, this is not your only opportunity to discuss the core values, but I think it's, it, it provides a great chance to do that. Um, and as you can see, this photo shows, you know, the kids doing a, a, a quick task where, you know, they were given a few minutes, you know, they're usually based on time. We tied, you know, two ends of a rope together and they were blindfolded and they had to, you know, create as perfect a square as they could come up with, um, which uh, is, is harder than it looks. So um, create team building activities that help your team get to know each other. They'll identify each other's strengths through these activities. They'll improve communication skills. They'll develop leadership skills. Um, they'll become better at managing time because as I said, they're often timed tasks. Um, and, uh, and they'll strengthen problem solving skills because they're learning how to think quickly and on their feet. Um, they also quite frankly, just ease the tension. You know, if you're working on the robot and the robot isn't uh, behaving well, that was always a good time to take a break and go do a fun team building activity. Um, or you can use your team building activities as a transition between uh, your activities. Let's say you're, you, you plan your meeting, you're gonna spend 45 minutes working on the robot and then maybe another 45 minutes working on the, the project, then use that middle time to you know, uh, do a fun team building activity. Um, and then you know, you'll talk about it. So these are some examples of our tried and true uh, uh, team building activities. It should be no surprise that a lot of them uh, will use Lego. Um, you know, you might do a five minute building challenge with Legos where the kids have to, you know, create some sort of structure. Uh, one of my favorite activities is the second one on the list. We call it reverse engineering. And what I would do is I'd take about I would take two identical sets of Lego pieces, you know, maybe eight to 10 uh, pieces. They'd be different brick shapes and different colors, um, but the two sets would be the same. I'd break the, the team into, you know, two parts and they'd sit across from each other on the table. One side would be the builders and one side would be the instructors. The builders are given the loose pieces and the instructors are given, you know, a, a, 
a model using the eight to 10 pieces that I quickly built, you know, without the others seeing at the beginning of the meeting, you know, just some crazy structure. It was never anything um, in particular. I just put the pieces together. Um, and then they, they put their binders out front because the idea is that the other team doesn't get to see what the structure looks like. The kids are given the task to clearly give directions on how to put that together. Um, and so this is working on their communication skills and how they speak to each other. Um, uh, when the activity is complete, you know, and it could be this activity or maybe you gave them the task of doing, you know, one of those small dollar store, you know, jigsaw puzzles. Um, when the task is complete, the most important step is talking about, you know, how it went. Um, don't overlook this step because it's really important. Ask questions like, you know, how do you think the activity went? What did you do well? Where did communication break down if it did? Um, and at first the students are very fixated on whether or not they accomplished the task. And I remind them that, you know, I don't care if I don't see a finished jigsaw puzzle at the end of the activity. Um, I'm much more concerned about, you know, how, how they worked as a team. So while at first the kids may not be as critical of themselves, you know, they, they get to the point where they start to understand if you shift that focus for them. Um, I'll remind them that, you know, I want to see how they interacted together, how they spoke to each other. Did they include everyone? Did they divide the job into separate tasks, you know, that's always really good to see, you know, if they're working on, say, a jigsaw puzzle, you know, if they can start assigning roles, one of you, you know, flip the pieces over, one of you work on the edges, you know, one of you work on the inside parts. Um, those are great things um, to, to really get them working as a team. And I think it's going to um, benefit the team uh, throughout the season um, if you have those conversations. Um, so I'd like to, you know, shift our focus to uh, the robot game right now. And uh, as we transition to talking about that, um, one of your first activities will actually serve as a great team building activity. Um, and that is to build the Cargo Connect mission models. Um, these are the Lego structures that will get fastened to your table with the dual lock, you know, which is like the little plastic Velcro uh, that sticks to the table. Um, Allow two to three hours to build the mission models. Um, if you're using that team meeting guide that I mentioned earlier, first actually breaks this down into the first four sessions, but a lot of coaches like to knock this out in the first uh, uh, couple of meetings. Um, build the models carefully and correctly to avoid problems later. Use, you know, tell the students to just use the directions provided by first, um, and they can work in, you know, groups of two or three so that each group is working on a different model. You might want to use cookie trays or you know, cookie sheets or trays or, or even just work on the floor so that the pieces don't get away from you. And then as they complete those models, uh, just uh, have the kids stick them onto the mat with the dual lock that's provided. Um, you may find that none of your students have ever seen an FL challenge competition before. And if that's the case, I think it's really important to help them understand the basic principles of the game. So to provide a bit of an introduction, I think it's great if you can find a couple of uh, YouTube videos from the last two seasons, that would be City Shaper or Replay, um, so that your students can you know, get an idea of how the robot game works. Um, don't go back further than two seasons because um, that was the time when uh, first shortened the playing field a bit and allows for a section on the field that is home base. So if you go back further than the last two years, that might cause a bit of confusion for your team. Um, and use of videos is a way to show your students how the game works, um, how the robot gets launched, um, how the, the, you know, a two and a half minute match can be divided into several robot runs, how the kids line up, you know, next to the, the uh, launching area and, you know, two at a time go up to the field and will launch the robot. Um, and then those two can switch out. So the next two come up and they can do the next run and then the next two can come up. Um, that's a great way to get everyone involved. Um, showing videos also, they can see that sometimes, you know, you have to retrieve the, the robot when it gets stuck. And I think it's reassuring 
for them to see that that happens. It happens often, you know, they'll lose some penalty points for that, but it's all part of the game. Um, and then maybe remind students that um, when they're watching, you know, a video from a previous season, these are probably really experienced teams who are posting videos. Um, so, you know, that you don't want to try to emulate um, these teams um, because they they certainly, as rookies, they, they need to work at their own pace. Um, and I think, you know, it's also good to discourage your students from watching the current season's videos because um, it can just be a distraction for rookies and uh, it may leave them feeling, you know, impatient with the tasks that they're accomplishing or, you know, feeling discouraged. Um, and we'll talk more about that uh, in a few minutes. Um, the next uh, area is, is talking strategy, which, you know, I love this part about the game. Um, and you'll want to start talking strategy before your team even builds the robot. Um, you want to get the kids to, you know, really get the ha their hands on the mission models so that they can assess what the robot needs to do to complete each of the uh, missions on the board. Um, you know, ask questions like, you know, do you need to push something or pull something or collect something or move something? Um, and then start asking questions like, you know, which which uh, missions might you be able to combine, you know, based on a similar task, maybe it would have a similar attachment, you wouldn't have to switch that attachment out. Um, maybe you want to group them based on difficulty um, um, or location on the field, you know, they may not want to tackle the ones that are so far away from the launching area, because that will certainly eat more minutes off of the, you know, two and a half minute clock that they're, they're working with. Um, so later on in the season, it's great to discuss risk versus reward. Um, they'll ask questions like, um, is this a mission that our robot can navigate along the wall or follow a line that would make it you know, more reliable? Um, is this something that um, I can successfully do or we can successfully do most of the time? Or is it one that maybe the robot gets stuck a lot of the time? We might have to pick it up and lose penalty points. Is that going to be worth you know, the reward if we get it right? Um, and those are just fun questions to, uh, to you know, chat about throughout your season. Um, as far as choosing a system goes, um, if you're brand new to FLL, you will likely purchase the new equipment. Um, so the spike, the spike Prime will be for you. Um, with Spike Prime, students can use the uh, Scratch programming language, which many of them may already be familiar with. Um, it's really user-friendly, drag-and-drop language that's used, you know, to teach the, the basic principles of code. Um, if you do have access to the newly retired uh, EV3, that's totally fine, and it's, you know, also a very straightforward system. The EV3 will continue to be a popular choice among FLL challenge teams, um, but it's important to know that the LEGO Mindstorms EV3 home edition software um, has retired as of this year and is no longer supported by the LEGO group. So um, in its place is the LEGO Mindstorms EV3 home app, um, which features a coding language uh, based on Scratch and will offer you a similar experience to the Spike Prime. Um, if you are using the uh, Spike Prime, I encourage you to uh, hop on the uh, First Indiana YouTube page uh, and go under the FLL Challenge playlist. Um, my son created a video for our rookie teams last year uh, to help them as they were unpacking their Spike Prime and extension pack kits. Um, he's an FLL alum who's had eight years of experience and what he does is he walks you through all the pieces in the kit that are most uh, useful and relevant for an FLL challenge team. Um, it's a brief video and something that you can watch with your students as you are unpacking your own kit if you have not done that yet. Um, so when it comes to the robot game, uh, the best advice that I can give new and developing teams is uh, just to keep it simple. Um, remind your students that everything that they use on their robot has to be official Lego pieces. Um, even if you use, say, rubber bands to tie something back, you know, an attachment or, you know, your robot itself, they need to be official uh, Lego rubber bands. Um, choose simple mechanisms. Um, 
as these are truly enough to accomplish many of the tasks on the board. Um, and a simple robot design will allow your students to navigate the, the playing field a lot more easily than uh, something that is much larger um, that you might see more advanced teams building. Um, as I said before, resist the urge to, uh, to emulate advanced teams. Um, that's why we had a rule on our team not to watch any material from the current season, you know, no videos from the current season. Um, you don't want to skip over the important learning uh, steps um, that the kids need to walk through. Um, because they may want to try to recreate something that they've seen in a video. And, you know, it's better to accomplish fewer missions on the table um, and really learn how uh, to walk through those steps. Um, I would also discourage teams from downloading code. You'll find that there's a lot of code out there that you can download, including line followers. Um, but I think it's it's much better if you can help your students create a very simple line follower because you want them to be able to understand how it works and they'll miss that if you just simply download the line follower. You want them also to be able to explain how it works to a judge if they're asked that question in, you know, in a competition room. Um, there is a uh, there is code for a guided mission that first will you know intentionally walk uh, teams through to get you started, and that is a really useful uh, tool. So you know you want to make sure that you do that with your team, and that can be found in the um, challenge uh, updates and resource page that we linked before. Um, I would encourage though at your competitions um, and also during the summer, um, encourage your students to observe how other teams uh, solve the same tasks that you try to solve on the mission table. Um, this is a great way for kids to inspire each other, see how other, you know, what other kids thought about, you know, ways that they tackled the problems. And uh, it may teach them some strategies that they can in, in, employ the following season. Um, and really it gets them fired up about, you know, coming back that next season and trying out new things. Um, Moving on to the uh, innovation project, um, you will often hear the catchphrase that first is more than robots, and it is true. Um, through the first program, students really learn how to be innovators, um, tackling problems on a local level or even a global level. Um, and uh, they discover, which is my favorite part, that they are not too young to make an impact, a significant impact on their world. Um, and I've seen it happen and, uh, and it's really, you know, truly empowering for students. Um, they are, you know, during the Cargo Connect season, they're going to uh, be given the task to identify and define a problem that they've uh, found with the transportation of products. Um, they'll need to brainstorm as many solutions to that problem that they can come up with because, you know, your first solution isn't always the best solution. So the more you can come up with, the better. Um, they'll need to select the most promising solution um, and, you know, maybe explain to the judges how they selected that one good solution that they wanted to pursue for the rest of the season. They'll then need to come up with a prototype, um, nothing fancy. It doesn't have to be a working prototype. They just need to, you know, either sketch something, you know, draw something, create a model. It could be a Lego model. They could do it out of clay, anything they want. If they know CADing, they can certainly do it with CADing. Um, and then they'll want to test and evaluate their prototype. And they'll do this by sharing it with experts who um, work in the field that you're studying, um, maybe find someone who could use the solution that the kids created and they can help them evaluate how useful that uh, solution would be. And then the best part is that they'll take that feedback that they learn from the experts or the users of the, of, uh, the solution and take the feedback and go back to the drawing board and make some iterations um, to their prototype. Um, and then they'll communicate that at an event to uh, the judges. Um, as you can see, this is the engineering design process. So it's important for your students to understand what the engineering design process is, what those steps are, and how they can use the engineering uh, design process to, you know, really do everything uh, in their FLL challenge season from building their robot to the attachments to their innovation project prototype. Um, I suggest looking for 
a diagram of the engineering design process, which you know they're all over the internet. So find one that you like. Uh, this is the one that we always used. Um, I had my team keep a three ring binder um, of all of our robot and project related materials that we collected throughout the season. Um, we'd look for a binder that has that clear sleeve on the front and we would stick this diagram on the front of the binder. Um, and the students um, you know, have easy access to it. Um, many students also like to keep their own binder you know, for FLL. So I'd give them a copy of, of that to stick in their binder as well. And while you're at it, um, I can't resist to, to encourage you to you know, print off the core values for them as well um, and keep that handy. Um, for your students. Um, in that engineering binder, um, FIRST now gives everyone an engineering notebook as well. Um, so what we would just do is, you know, keep all of these uh, little booklets in your engineering uh, notebook. Um, but other content that you could include might be, say, photo documentation of your robot, you know, how it's changed from, you know, early in the season to late in the season, maybe photos from field trips that you attended. Um, you could keep communication, you know, email communication with experts um, that you speak with. Um, if you have, say, a video call with an expert or you meet them in person, you know, you can have a student write a summary of that uh, encounter and keep that in your notebook. Um, and, uh, and it's great because, you know, the notebook is something that you want to keep organized and you, you typically will have you know a student or two on your team who is really into organization give them the job of keeping that notebook organized so that you can take it to an event um, and uh, and share it with others um, of course our presentations are are virtual this year but you know the judges might ask you a question you know how did your project uh, evolve uh, over the season and if they have photo documentation that's you know handy they can pull that out of the notebook and show it to uh, the judges uh, uh, during their presentation um, as i mentioned before uh, the rubrics will help you uh, as you're planning your goals for the season um, but they'll also help you map out uh, the five minute presentations, um, the, the five minute innovation project and the five minute um, robot design presentation that your students will write. Um, so I was just gonna walk you through a little exercise that uh, I like to you know, have my students do that will help them as they're writing their scripts for their presentations. You have a lot of uh, material to cover you know, in your presentation and you only have five minutes to do it. Uh, the kids like to create really fun and engaging presentations. They might be, you know, a commercial or a skit or a Shark Tank like, you know, skit. Um, and, uh, you know, they can get carried away with making it fun and exciting, but you want to remind them that they also have to pack that with, with some good content and details. So by looking at the rubric, you can see what it is that the judges are want to, going to, you know, glean from their uh, presentations. Um, so what I'll do with the kids is I'll divide that into its parts and uh, I'll uh, you know, cut, the, cut the first section out and put it on a blank page. And then um, the, the uh, scripted material that I have here um, is just an example of what the kids might fill in on that page. So I'd ask them to you know, put in your own words, what does this section of the rubric mean to you? Um, so the identify section, they might say, oh, it means you know, we have to identify and research a specific problem related to making the transportation journey of products better. Um, and then you know, I'd have them jot down a few questions that they would need to answer in order to give this information in their presentation. You know, how did you conduct research? What sources did you use? Did you consult any experts? And how did you find those experts? Um, did those experts help you identify the problem or did you find the problem all on your own? Those are the types of, of things they wanna focus on um, for this section of the rubric. And then uh, the next section is design. So I would just repeat that. I'd stick that section on a blank piece of paper. They would re, uh, work, you know, put that into their own words. This is where we would need to share how we brainstormed um, 
a lot of ideas um, to come up with our solution. Um, how did you generate the ideas? Did you get inspiration from field trips? Uh, did you look at current solutions to the problem that you were addressing and did they inspire you? Um, and, uh, and just you know, list out all of those you know, potential things that they could talk about in their presentation. The next sec section is create. Um, this is where they will create um, a new or improved solution and make a prototype. You know? um, so this is where you might want to ask the question, how does your prototype represent the solution or the problem that you're solving? Um, uh, and then just you know, follow, follow that line of thought um, and include those you know, important parts in their, uh, their presentation. The, uh, let's see, the next section is iterate. And this is where you wanna talk about the experts um, and the users that you might have interviewed who could use uh, the team's idea. Um, and, and it's where you wanna show, you know, what did you do with the feedback that you learned from these experts? Um, how did you go back to the drawing board, as I mentioned before, and make some changes or updates or improvements to your solution? And you want to, you know, walk the judges through all of those steps as the kids are, are giving their presentation. Um, the last section um, uh, doesn't really have a list of questions, but just, you know, suggestions for the kids. You know, this is where they, they uh, get marked for how well they communicated their ideas. Um, and I always reminded the students, you know, you need to be excited about your solution because if you're not excited, you're not gonna be able to get other people excited about it. Um, so this is where you wanna convey why this was meaningful to you. Um, you know, how did you seek inspiration? Did someone tell you a story that really moved you and inspired you to come up with a solution? Um, let their creativity come through, you know, do that team identity and branding, get that in there with, you know, their props, um, you know, and, and just make it fun. You know, the uh, judges will have fun if they see the kids having fun and, uh, and, and that will be a great way for them to share uh, their story with the judges. Um, so just a couple more pieces of advice that I'd want to share with you. Um, lean on your community resources, um, especially for finding experts. Um, we always found experts at our local universities, community colleges, local businesses. Um, we formed relationships with people and you know, we kept in touch with them throughout the course of the season. Um, go on field trips. Now this year it might be in-person field trips, but there's also a lot of great virtual field trips. You know, Amazon does a great virtual field trip that you can, you know, take um, and engage local media whenever you can. Um, you can invite the media to come to your build space. You know, the kids can share their presentations with the media. They can, you know, launch their robot and have it tackle a few missions. Um, it'll get the kids on the news, but more important, every time they share their idea with someone, it gives you an opportunity um, to find someone who, you know, might help the kids develop their solution a little bit further. Um, it might help you find a sponsor for the team or maybe recruit new team members. Um, but more important, it helps your students um, develop those public speaking skills um, by giving them practice. Every time they share their story with someone, they're learning that this gets a little bit easier each time they do it. Um, and it will certainly help them uh, prepare for their, their competition day. Um, and, you know, and, and just practicing that, you know, practicing those presentations, you know, it does get easier for the, for the, for your students um, the more that you do. Um, we always like to invite guests back to um, our uh, build space. You know, you may have limitations this year with COVID, but you could, you know, get creative and maybe do it virtually. Um, but invite parents, teachers, certainly the experts that you communicated with through the season and allow them to watch the, the presentation. And even better, allow them to ask your students some questions because that will certainly help them prepare for the questions that the judges will ask. Um, and really just know that you are ready whether you think so or not. Um, you know, people are sometimes hesitant to go to a, the first competition their rookie year, but it is so valuable to go to an event. Um, it all comes together when the kids see, you know, what an event looks like, what it's like in a judging room, you know, when you see those, you know, judges in front of you and it will get so much easier 
in uh, year two for you when you when you start the process over again. Um, and just, you know, remind your kids to share their story, make it meaningful and celebrate the hard work uh, that they did all season long. Um, I just wanted to show you at the end, this is that challenge page that I referenced several times. Um, the rubrics are listed on here. The season videos are listed on here. Um, that guided mission that first walks you through is here, whether you're doing spike prime or EV3, it'll walk you through how to do that one guided mission. Um, it's also a great way to, um, you know, revisit this page for the updates and, uh, and it might also help you understand that shared mission. We didn't talk about that, but um, there's always one mission on the board where uh, the students kind of interact with the other team. It kind of um, is in the spirit of cooperation um, and it's good for them to kind of understand how that works. That's the airdrop mission with the helicopter this year. Um, so use this page as a resource for you. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. And, uh, and I think we have a couple minutes for questions um, before our next session starts. Yeah, hey, Lori, um, we had a couple questions. Um, one, the, that um, engineering uh, design process screen that you had, uh, if there was a way for you to, um, maybe you could drop it to me somehow and then I could share it out. They were, uh, somebody wanted a copy of that. No um, and then there's also a, there's also a good video that goes along with that too. So I'll try to find that. Um, that uses I think that I idea. dropped that video in. Yeah. So I did. I should have labeled it in the chat. Um, I did put a link to that video. I found it. Yeah, um, the video is cute. And then, um, is there a way to get more of the engineering notebooks? They only ever send uh, two for each team. I did then drop a link to that um, where. Uh, first has a new thing in the dashboard called Thinkscape for all of you. Um, you can get an interactive or static version of the engineering notebooks in there. Um, but then I do think for an additional cost, when you um, register, you can, um, uh, you can order more uh, of the print ones. So, uh, but I did drop the link in there to access that um, Thinkscape stuff. So then another question, how do we use the guided mission? Yeah, so the, the guided mission, if you click on that, on that updates, uh, that challenge resources and updates page, um, you just click on either, you know, whichever platform you're using, the Spike Prime or the EV3, and um, it'll walk you through how to solve that mission, you know, how to code it to uh, the mission model that you're using. You don't have to do that. You know, the, the kids can, you know, come up with their own solution, um, but it's kind of a nice first activity that will help you, you know, kind of figure out the bigger picture and, and what you're trying to do for all of the other missions on, on the playing field. First, basically wanted to give everyone, you know, a successful start so that you could go to an event and, you know, at the very least you could do that one guided mission. Um, and I do want to say we've been to many events where rookie teams, you know, um, well, you know, this is where goal, you know, making your goals are, are important. Um, it may be your goal just to go to an event and tackle one or two missions on the board. I think there's 16 or 17 missions. Most teams don't do all of those missions. They don't get anywhere close to doing all of those missions, but they're laid out so the kids can kind of pick and choose what which ones are most interested. And they'll find out very quickly which ones look super hard and which ones look like something they might be able to tackle in their first year. Um, but you have had a successful event if you were able to go out and meet your goals. And if your goal was just to do one or two missions, then you, know, you, sh you should celebrate that accomplishment and forget about what the rest of the board looks like or what anybody else's scores look like. Um, okay. Well. Uh, I know we have a few other questions. We are a couple of minutes away uh, where we're going to have Brian Baylor come on and uh, do his